Okay, so we are going to talk real quick recap about what we talked about last week because again this book it builds on itself week after week and we kind of see the same story told in different ways but looking at Revelation it helps us understand what even we are reading here by looking at the past. So we are through two sevenfold visions. The vision of the seven seals of the scroll and the vision of the seven trumpets. What is the vision of? What events is it describing? Jesus, gets into heaven. Jesus, Jesus goes to heaven all the way to comes back. The, the, comes back, the last day, right? It's the now. The sevenfold visions are what we are going through right now. We saw Jesus poke his head into heaven, his coronation, then the scrolls are opened. There's pestilence, there's suffering, there's war, there's turmoil, just like there is right now. And then at the end, the 144,000, the whole church together is gathered up, raised up from the great tribulation. We get the second sevenfold vision with the trumpets. We get plagues, fire, hail, trees. Uh, we get wormwood. We get demonic afflictions, like ha things are happening right now. We have death to one third, but not to all, because death for the whole world. God is protecting us from a complete extinction. And then what happens? Then the Christians are gathered up and raised. Chapter 11, we're going to go back. We just briefly touched on it last week. We're going to go into a little bit more detail of it today. This is the end of that second sevenfold vision. As you see, the, um, the title of the second part is the seventh trumpet. So this is the last part of it. So there's been afflictions, there's been plagues, there's demonic affliction, there's been death, and now what? The two witnesses, chapter 11. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff. And I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over the nations. And they will trample on the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses. And they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony... The beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that is symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in the tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because the two prophets have been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and the great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here! And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is to come. All right. A lot to unpack there. We briefly went over the first few verses last week. I'm going to make the argument that this is our story. To do that, we have to find out who these two witnesses are, who these figures are, what these numbers mean. So let's start with the numbers. We talked about John receiving a measuring rod, but not the whole temple, because some of the people of God would still be persecuted. And we hear that they're going to persecute the they're going to trample over the or they're going to trample over the holy city for 42 months. 
What does the number 42 mean? Why is it significant? We briefly talked about this last week. Does anyone remember? Not, not quite. Not quite. 42. How many years was Israel? Three and a half years. Let's, let's start there. We'll get to three and a half in a second. That's connected. It, it is connected. How many years is Israel in the desert for? For how many years? 40. What is the total amount of years from their free, freedom from Egypt all the way to the entrance to the promised land? It's 42, and I'll prove it. Go to... Uh, Oh, what word? Uh, Numbers. Numbers chapter 1. This is before their exile. For their, their, their time in the wilderness. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the temple of meeting on the first day of the second month in the... What year? Second year. Second year. There are two years before the 40 years in the wilderness. So that's where the 42 comes from. So 42 years, 42, is this number describing something good? No, it's a, it's a time of wandering in the wilderness. And did good things happen to the Israelites while they're in the desert? No, a lot of plague and sorrow. Well, that's a good word. Okay. 1260. Where does this number come from? This number of days, days. Do 42 times 30. Number of days and what do you get? Years. You get 1260. So when you hear the number 42 and number 1260, they're the same. Three and a half. Where does that number come from? Well, how many days are in three and a half years? How many days are in three and a half years? Twelve, about 1260. So when you hear the number three and a half, 1260 and 42, they're all referring to the same thing. Patricia, what, what? What is the time? What, what is happening during that time? Just like for the Israelites in the wilderness, it's a time of sadness, sadness of sorrow, of wandering, of not good things happening. Go ahead. You're saying, but there's also a quote in this chapter of the <clears throat> messengers being three and a half days. It doesn't say the three and a half years days. Exactly, yes. 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 So I would, I, would, I would say that the symbolism is there, that three and a half is still connecting to these numbers, right? Is it not, it's not years, right, but that three and a half, I mean, there's a, there's a serious connection there. By the way, there's also another way the scripture talks about this, a time, times, and half a time. If we go to verse... Actually, we're going to go to... Uh, Third. Let's go to Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. So many places to go. Where do I even start? Chapter 7, verse 25. We're going to come back to this passage. But this is the time where the kingdoms are against God's people. A time of suffering and sorrow. Verse 25. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So a time is one, times is two, and half a time is a well, half. So one plus two plus a half is three and a half. So these are all referring to the same thing. Does that make sense? This will be much more significant in the next couple chapters. But it's also important to note that this time is now. 
We are in the 42 years now in the wilderness waiting for the promised land, right? We are in a time of persecution and suffering now. That's what the three full visions were about, right? That there are plagues and war and turmoil and death now. We're waiting for that to end, for Christ to return. All right. Then we get to the two witnesses. Who are the two witnesses? <laughs> Controversial, yes. What do you say, Gil? Angels, messengers from God. Okay, messengers from God. Elijah. Okay, so Elijah or Moses. I'm going to start by saying certainly there are attributes attributed to Elijah and Moses. The things that they are doing strike very similar to the miracles that happened through Elijah and Moses. Give an example. Um, the power to shut the sky and no rain falling and turning the water to blood. Does that sound like Moses? Let's go to Elijah real quick. Let's go to 2 Kings. <coughs> Second Kings chapter 1. There's no way we're going to get through three chapters tonight. It's a dream, a beautiful dream that will be crushed. <laughs> but Elijah answered the captain of fifty, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and you fifty. And then let's go to 1 Kings chapter 17. Verse 1. And this is the better one, the better verse. Here it is. Now Elijah the Tishbite, the Tishvi of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall neither be dew nor rain these years except for my word. So we see these miracles that these two witnesses are doing uh, very similar to the things that Elijah and Moses did. Are these literally Moses and Elijah, or do they symbolize Moses and Elijah? I'm going to say they symbolize Moses and Elijah, and there's a reason why. Because these two witnesses are also described as two things. In verse 4, what else are they described as? Witnesses. They're witnesses, but what in, what in verse 4? What are they described as? These are the... Olive trees and lampstands. Do we know of any symbol where something is described as a lampstand in the book of Revelation? The church, the churches. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 1. I'm sorry we're skipping around so much. We're going to do a little bit less of that in a moment. But back to Revelation chapter 1. Go to verse, uh, where are we at? Verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars of the angels of seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So if these two, will, two witnesses are lampstands, what are these two witnesses meant to represent? The church. This is the church. Continuing the ministry of Moses and Elijah, proclaiming God's truth. We doing all right so far. Does that make sense? Okay, let's keep going. What happens to the two witnesses? They get killed. Mm -hmm. After what? After witnessing. After the demonic people come out of the cave. Not quite. What happens first before that? What are the witnesses done with? Their testimony. Their testimony. So if these two witnesses are the church, what are we having described here? We are having described the now to the end. So the two witnesses, the church, are going out and proclaiming the gospel, the news about Jesus. And when they are done, when the church is complete, then what happens? The, the devil comes out of the bottomless pit. The devil comes out, 
kills the church, but is that the end for the church? Their dead bodies are lying on the ground and the world laughs. <laughs> that church was such a nuisance to us for so long and now they're gone. And then what happens? Christ says, come on up. And the two witnesses of the church rises from the dead. Kind of sounds very similar. Uh, the same fate as uh, the Lord had. Say again, Billy? They had the same fate as the Lord had. That's right. That's right. It's the same story we've heard in the, the visions. That what happens to the church, church does its ministry, it's persecuted. When it's done, they die and God raises them from the dead to new life. How are we feeling? Does that make sense? Yes, but what about, you're saying it's the church, so it's an establishment. What about the... When I say the church, I mean the Christians, the people of God on earth. What about the fire and the closing the heavens and all that? The church can do that? So again, we see that these two witnesses represent the ministry of Moses and Elijah. Continuing, what did, what did Moses and Elijah do? What do they do, Alan? Uh, they down from okay, for what purpose? To prove witness to God. Witness to God. Witness to who God is, right? So is there symbolism here for what the church is? Yes, absolutely. What is the church supposed to do? Witness to God. And by the way, has the church done great signs like Elijah and Moses in history? Yes, the early church we hear in Acts has done miracles to proclaim the kingdom of God to others. So yes, I, I, I think the evidence is very heavy that these two witnesses are indeed the church. And if you inter interpret them as the church, it fits in really nicely to these two visions. So this first vision we had, right? Remember, it's the seals. And what happens when the seals are opened? There's disease, there's war, there's plagues. Then what happens? Christians are killed. Then the end of the world begins. Christians are sealed by God. And what happens to them? Raised up to the throne of God and the world ends. The second vision we're in. What happens? Bad stuff. There's plagues on earth. The church continues to do the work of God and then it is killed. And the enemies of, of the church rejoice, but is that the end? No, the church rises from the dead because Jesus raises us up. We're resurrected. We go up. What does it say? Jesus said in verse 12, Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies watched them. That's, that's our story, raised up to Christ. And then, of course, the end of the world happens, which is what the seventh trumpet is. Let's read that seventh trumpet. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord, of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time of the dead to be judged. And for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the, war, of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. What happens when the seventh trumpet is blown? God's temple opens, and it's the end. End of story two. End of vision two. Why is verse 19 so significant when we talk about lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder, earthquake, heavy hail? Isn't that what happens in heaven? Okay, maybe. You the and the we see this happen two other times in this book. Is that what happened right after the crucifixion? Christ died. Yeah. 
Yes, yes, there's rumblings, there's earthquakes, right? But in the conscious revelation, what does this verse mark? The, the second end of the vision. What happens? Go back to chapter 6. Verse 12. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth, and the moon, the full moon, became blood. I'm sorry, let me go to sorry. Uh, chapter 8. Chapter 8 is where I wanted to go. Chapter 8, verse 5. The seventh seal is opened. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So what happens when the seventh seal is opened? The end. This verse about rumblings and lightning and earthquake, it marks the end of the world, the last day. So, when we see it here in chapter 11, what does this mean? It is the, the end. So, if we interpret the two witnesses as the church, this fits really nicely. Because the second vision, is, second, second um, sevenfold vision, the trumpets are blown, and there's plagues, and the demons come up and afflict people, and there's death, but not everyone dies. Things get really bad, but then the two witnesses, the church is doing its work until it's done. And then when it's done, Christ raises us up from the dead. The seventh trumpet is blown and the end. Sounds very familiar, right? Does that make sense? Why would we interpret Revelation this way? Rich? The two ends are happening at the same time. It's not like it's one end and then there's... This is the same story told differently. Yes. So again, we're reading Revelation as cyclical. It's telling us the same story in different ways multiple times. Rebecca. It's not like it's happening like, over and over. Because that's how I'm seeing No, it. yeah, see? See, that's one of the dangers people have when they read Revelation. They read it chronologically. It's one line. Oh, the end of the world is going to happen four different times? No, 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 no. This is the story, one story of Jesus ascends into heaven. Things get bad, Christians are persecuted, people die, end of the world. People are raised up into heaven. We tell it multiple times. When we read Revelation this way, it actually becomes simpler. You actually can get stuff out of this, I find. If you read it as one chronological thing, you just end up going like, what am I, what am I, Al, you and I talked about what the timeline would look if you try to read this chronologically. It's a bear, it's a nightmare. But if you read this as the same story multiple times, it, it's clear. In fact, in the next couple of chapters, we're going to see the story told again, and you're going to be able to see it a little bit clearer with all the symbolism that this is the story of Christ to the end. Make sense? Okay, let's keep going. Chapter 12. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask me, all right? There's a lot to unpack here, and I am glossing over some stuff. I want to give you the central message though because if we get hung up on the details again we will be here forever and we will suffer there's symbolism in this book but we want to focus on what is actually being said okay the woman and the dragon when we talked about the three sevenfold visions we went to the second one where are we are we on in heaven or are we on earth we are on earth because there are plagues and there's people dying and people aren't you know dying in heaven I mentioned at the beginning of this Bible study, there are two threads. The stuff happening on earth and stuff happening in heaven. The first glimpse we had was Jesus' coronation scene, remember? When we said, okay, what happened after Jesus ascended into the clouds? Well, Revelation chapter 4 and 5 tell us, Jesus is crowned king. And he has the scroll and he brings about the end. Now, in chapter 12, we're getting another glimpse of the cosmic things happening. In fact, we're getting the story of Jesus sending into heaven to the end from Jesus and the devil's perspective, from a heavenly point of view. So we'll get some cool details here. Okay? Let's start. Chapter 12. And a great sign appeared in where? Heaven. heaven. A woman clothed with the sun 
with the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, how much time are we going to spend interpreting what these symbols mean? Not long. What do they probably mean? Something great, something powerful, right? 12 stars, you might think of the 12 apostles or 12 uh, patriarchs of Israel. Verse 2, she was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for... 1260 days, a time maybe of not greatness, of sorrow or wandering. All right, this is a very key, key passage to understand. First, um, who's the dragon? Satan. Satan. How do you know it's Satan? Because he, <laughs> he wants to eat the baby. That's cool. That's, that, that, that's one way. You want to know why we know it's Satan? Because John tells us, if you skip ahead to verse, cha- or verse 9, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. So we know the dragon is Satan. Who, then, the key to understanding this passage, is the woman. Okay, so some people say Mary. Why would we think it's Mary, Rich? Because Mary gave birth to Jesus. Then I'm, I'm assuming you guys know who the child was that was born, right? It is Jesus. And what happens to Jesus when he's born? What does Revelation say in chapter 12? In this chapter, what does he say happens? Not Jesus. Jesus is brought up into heaven. So that's kind of interesting. If this was Mary, there seems to be a little bit of something that doesn't really fit in the story. Because first of all, with Mary, we never hear about anguish and pain and birth. Now, I'm sure that happened, but we never hear about that in the Bible. But we definitely don't hear about Mary being where? In the wilderness. We don't hear about that. So maybe this is not Mary. Who else could this be then? Who could this woman symbolize? Can't be God. It's not God. Who? Okay. Maybe the Israelites. Maybe a little bit more than that. Medusa. What's up? Medusa. Medusa. Think about that. Who did I say the two witnesses symbolize? Mm-hmm. The church. So let's combine these two ideas together. The Israelites and the church... I'm going to argue that this woman is the whole people of God from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And if you interpret this way, it kind of makes sense. First of all, the crown of 12 stars, uh, the 12 patriarchs of Israel, the 12 apostles, that fits very well. Where does Jesus come from? A human, yes, but like what people? He's Hebrew, the people of God, the people of Israel. So, could you describe the people of Israel who are waiting for the Savior of Jesus to be in agony? Were the Israelites in agony ever in the Old Testament, waiting for Jesus? Throughout the whole Old Testament, the Israelites are in agony. Please send us a Savior already. We are in persecuted persecution. We are in exile. Okay, and then, so, if the woman is the Israelites, Jesus comes from the Israelites, born of the woman, who could be interpreted as Mary, right? Because Mary is an Israelite from the people of God. Then the red dragon, who's the devil? When Jesus is born, what does he try to do? How does he do that? By snatching him out to, to help him obey him. Okay. Okay, so the temptations in the wilderness. How else does the dragon try to destroy Jesus? Herod, okay, so the story of the little babies being killed. What else? Pharisees. Pharisees. What do the Pharisees do to Jesus? They kill 
Put him on a cross. That sounds like the devil trying to destroy Jesus. Uh, is, he, is the devil successful? No, because what happens to Jesus? He rises from the dead, and what does the revelation say happens to him? He, he goes up to God and his throne, which we saw in chapter 4 and 5 when he's coronated as king. Coronated is a word, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not dumb. Good, good. Okay. Okay, then what happens to the woman now? After Jesus is up in heaven? She goes into the wilderness. So if the woman is the people of God from Old Testament to New Testament, this makes perfect sense. That after Jesus ascends into heaven, the 1260 days, that period of the church in the wilderness that we already heard about with the two witnesses, that is the time we are in now. That we are now in the wilderness waiting for Christ to come again. And let's keep going here because it makes much more sense. We keep reading what happens in verse 7. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient servant, serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ has come come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony for they love not their lives even unto death therefore rejoice O heavens and you who dwell in them but woe to you O earth and sea for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short and here's the key section here what is the devil doing now and when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman and who had given birth to the male child. Who's the woman? Church. The church, the people of God. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent in the, into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. That symbolic period of being in the wilderness, right? The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened his mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood in the sand of the sea. Bad news. What does the devil... For, okay, we'll get to that in a moment. The devil is thrown to earth, down to earth. We'll talk about that whole section in a moment. When the devil is thrown down to earth, what does he want to do? Persecute the church. Have we heard about this happening already in Revelation? Yes, when he is in the bottomless pit and he is sending out his demons to try to persecute the church. Do the demons... Are the demons successful? No. No. Is Satan successful in trying to destroy the woman? No. Why? What happens? She's in the wilderness, but what happens when the devil tries to go and destroy the woman? Given wings to escape the devil? And when the devil tries to throw out rivers to try to, is it to drown the woman? I'm trying to remember. Yeah. What happens? The earth? Uh, is God protecting this woman? Is God protecting the church? Yes. This is a key point for us. That as Christians, the devil has no power over us. This is key, right? Verse 17. And the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Who are the offspring of the church? Us. We're in this chapter. We are the offspring of the, the first people of the church. The devil is trying to get after us. But will he be successful? No. Uh, because God has bound Satan. And we are sealed with God's favor. And we are protected. And that's key, right? 
the offspring of those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. The woman and her offspring are the people who believe in Jesus. Does that make sense? Let's go back real quick because we got some cool cosmic warfare scene, a good action scene movie here, or action movie scene here. Verse 7, we talk about Satan is where? Before that. Before he gets cast down from the earth, where is he? He's in heaven. When does this happen? Jesus is born and then he goes up into heaven. This is very interesting, by the way. This is one of the places in Scripture where we get the idea that the devil is actually in heaven until until Jesus comes back after rising from the dead. He gets coronated and does what? It's my house. Get out. So the devil is actually in heaven until Jesus rises from the dead. We actually see this. You go back to Job. Remember the book of Job? What happens in Job? Yes. The devil tests Job with God's permission. If you go to Job chapter 1, verse 6, we actually see this, we actually see this scene. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and from the earth and from walking up and down on it. So before Jesus ascends into heaven, Satan has access to heaven. He can go back and forth all he wants. <clears throat> Interesting, right? But then what happens? Jesus comes up. He gets kicked out. Let's talk about that for a second. Does Jesus himself kick out Satan? Michael, the archangel. Jesus doesn't even get his hands dirty. That's how powerful Jesus is, right? Uh, just the angels of the Lord alone are enough to defeat the dragon, the devil, and his angels, and they are thrown out of heaven, thrown down to the earth. Why would the devil make war against Jesus in heaven? It's a big question, right, Rich? You wanted to rule. Wanted to rule? Jesus was going to take and send him out. Okay. Jesus is going to send him out. So Jesus Satan wants to be in the presence of God, just as Jesus is in the presence of God. Good. What else? What does Satan want not? What does, what does Satan not want more than anything else in the whole wide world? Worship. Satan, but what does Satan not want? Not quite. You're close, though. Be his God. Not follow God. Okay. He wanted Christ to fail. He wanted Christ to fail. Why? Because he wants to be crowned like Christ. <laughs> There's a hint. Let's, let's look real quick. Let's go to verse uh, 10. They're singing because Satan's out. He's defeated. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. Who are the brothers? Us. Us. Christians. Who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Be jealous of us. Okay. What does, Jesus, what does Satan not want for us? Eternal life. Eternal life. Eternal life. Eternal life. To be in heaven. To, we don't, oh, oh, Satan does not want God's people to be in heaven. When's the first time we see this? This desire come out. Adam and Eve. What does Satan do with Adam and Eve? Satan does not want Adam and Eve to be in God's presence. 
And so he deceives them, and the and Adam and Eve fall for it, and they go, go into sin. And what's the consequence for Adam and Eve's sin? The kicked out of the presence of God. Satan is called the accuser here because what does Satan do? He accuses us. You don't deserve to be in heaven because you're a sinner. That's what Satan says to us. But with Jesus, is that the case anymore? No. Satan's words are lies. Because Jesus has kicked Satan out and says, I will not judge these people by their sins. I will judge them by the blood, my blood on them. I have given them true forgiveness. That's what Christ has done for us when he takes his crown and kicks Satan out. Pretty cool, right? Questions on that section? section. Anything on this chapter you want me to go over? Does that make sense? Because this is, again, we just dis dissected a lot of symbolism. Women and dragons and mouths opening with rivers coming out. All of that, that is symbolism to describe these events. Jesus is born from the people of Israel. Jesus has tried to be defeated by Satan. Satan tries to defeat him, fails. Jesus goes to heaven, and the church is in the wilderness. When Jesus goes up into heaven, he kicks Satan out, and Satan tries to destroy the church. But is he successful? No. Let's keep the story going. Chapter 13, because Satan tries some other tactics to try to destroy the devil, or try to destroy the church. The first beast. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. By the way, ten horns and seven heads is the same way the dragon is described back in chapter, or verse 3 of chapter 12, with seven heads and ten horns. So do you think there's a connection between the first beast and the dragon? Uh, yes, I think so too. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, and its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave its power and its throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months, which is the time of now, the time we are in now, the time of the wandering in the wilderness, waiting to be in the promised land. Let's keep going. Ooh. Ah, verse 8, verse 6, sorry, verse 6. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If, every, if anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Okay. What is this first beast? That is a critical question to understand what on earth is going on in this section. If we can find the identity of the first beast, then we can make sense of what's happening here. Because if we keep the train of thought going, Satan's now back down on earth trying to destroy the church and not being able to. So he summons up this first beast. What is the first beast? We'll get to that. What is the first beast placed in opposition to the church? Let's go. We, we remember, remember in verse, um, verse 2, we see feet like a bear's, body like a leopard's, mouth like a lion's mouth. Well, that connects to the book of Daniel. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 2. I lied. Ja Daniel chapter 7. <laughs> Sorry, it's late. It 
7 verse 2. Daniel's vision of the four beasts. Daniel declared, I saw my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then I, as it looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, and four wings of a bird in its back, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth, it devoured and broke in pieces, and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. By the way, how many horns did the beast in Revelation have? Ten. Is there a connection here? Yeah. I think there's a pretty big connection here. So if we can figure out what Daniel is talking about in this section, who these four beasts are, I think we can come to the conclusion that that's the same thing we're hearing from John and Revelation. And guess what? Daniel actually tells us what this means. If you go to verse 17 of this chapter, where it says Daniel's vision interpreted, yes, we don't have to do the hard work. We don't have to guess. Daniel tells us, these four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. What are these beasts? People. People. They're kings. They're rulers. Let's go to verse 23 in, in Daniel chapter 7. And thus he said, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. And as for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and others shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and he shall put down three kings. And we read this verse already. He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time times and half a time. What is this beast here to do? Destroy the church. Yes. Wear out the saints of the Most High during the 42-month period, the 1260 days, during the three and a half years, or whatever the three and a half means, right? The time, times, and half a time. Who are these beasts? What does Daniel say they are? They're kings. Bingo! So the first beast in Revelation, who might be connected to the fourth beast of Daniel, we can see symbolizing kingdoms. Political, governmental powers that are against the church and that want nothing more than to destroy it. Satan can use the government can use society, cultural trends against the church in effort to destroy it. Billy. Would that be Rome? Yeah! So, could this be referring to Rome? I would say, yes. Does this refer to kingdoms after Rome, too? Yes! But especially, imagine you're the first one reading this book back in 100 A.D., and you just read it fresh from the scroll from John, and you read about this beast, about these kings killing us. Were Christians killed and persecuted in Rome? Uh, in the absolutely. Oh, yeah, in the Colosseum, right? Uh, absolutely. So, does the devil try to use the governing authorities to persecute the church? Do we still see that today? Do governments uh, across the sea persecute Christians? Uh, yes, they do. Questions? One thing I want to comment, there was a detail in there I especially want to focus on. Um, the mortal wound, back in verse 3, one of its heads had, seemed to have a mortal wound. One theory that some commentators have is this mortal wound represents the fact that does a king stay alive forever? 
No. Kings come and go, and they are replaced over and over and over, but they stay constant. There's always someone trying to persecute our faith somewhere in the world. In the early church, it was right in the backyard. It was in Rome. Nowadays, it's across the sea. But there is persecution that comes from these governing bodies. This section, verse 10, ends with some encouragement. Kind of. It's kind of some encouragement. It depends how you interpret it. If anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. I'm oh, sorry. Let's go to start verse 8. So all the nations will worship this beast. They will follow the first beast. They will follow the governing authorities. They will look to them for meaning and purpose. All on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Whose names are written in the book of life? The saints. Who is who? Us. Us. Those who believe in the Lamb. So, can the first beast defeat us forever? Can the governing authorities and, and kingdoms that rise and fall destroy the church? No. Will there be persecution? Yes. yes. And that's what this section means, by the way. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. And if anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. John's talking to the Christians here and saying, in life, you might be taken captive. You might be thrown in prison. You might even be killed with a sword. But can these kingdoms defeat us forever? No. We will be persecuted. We're not called to wage war against the first beast. No, we're called to go into captivity. We're called to die for our God, knowing that in the end, what is going to do those two witnesses lying dead in the floor? Raise them up to new life. That's what we look forward to. Questions on the first beast. Second beast. Antichrist, maybe? Let's read. We got like... Five minutes. <clears throat> then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. Let me stop there for a second. Like a lamb. Where else in the Bible do we hear about lambs? Jesus is what? The Lamb of God. This second beast has two horns like a lamb. Something that looks like Christ. But what else does it say about this beast? It talks like Satan. It talks like Satan. Looks like Christ, talks like Satan. Maybe, Jeff, maybe this is a false Christ, a false prophet, an antichrist. What does the word antichrist mean? What does it mean to be anti something? Yeah. Against. Something against Christ, but it's even more uh, uh, deceiving than that because it looks like it really could be the truth. But it's not. It's the voice of the dragon. Let's keep going. Verse 12. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs it, that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an, Im an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. By the way, are there people that don't turn to false religions? Are they slain? Were Christians slain for not uh, resorting to the pagan religions? Uh, yes, they were. Let's keep going, though. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Six, six. 
All right. We'll talk about that last verse at the end because it might be, might be, I would say, one of the most interesting in this book and one of the most famous in the whole Bible. You ask a non-Christian what 666 means and they'd probably say mark of the beast, mark of the devil, even if they're not Christian. Uh, this is how famous this verse is. But real quick, we see that the second beast is who? Antichrist. Who does what? He deceives, he imitates, he's false, he's a false prophet. What does he want to happen? What is he trying to do? The, they want the people to worship, worship the first beast, right? He's prophesying that you need to worship the way the culture's going. You need to worship, hey, the governor, he's a true God. Or you need to worship, hey, our, our, our nation is now going to have atheism be the state religion. You need to follow that. The false prophet is pointing to anyone but who? Christ. To Christ. What else does he do? He has the image of the, be of the beast on people that it might speak. And if you don't worship it, if you don't worship the first beast, what happens to you? You're, you're killed. Let's talk then about these next verses. About the mark. The mark on the right hand or on the forehead. What is the mark of the beast? Good question, right? Yeah. It's a barcode. <laughs> it's a barcode. You get a barcode tattoo on your right hand. You're Satan's. Uh, I'm going to make an argument against that. Yes. It's a symbol. Symbol? Okay. So, absolutely. A mark is a kind of symbol. Some people think like almost like a tattoo. But do you think this is a literal, visible mark? Yes. Maybe. But let's compare it to another type of mark we've already seen in Revelation. Or maybe a seal? Let's go back to Revelation chapter 7. What does Revelation chapter 7 talk about? The 144,000. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Who are the 144,000? All Christians. Let's go to verse 3. Saying, Do not harm the earth, or the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Just like the mark of the beast would go where? On people's foreheads. How are Christians marked as God's own people? And our baptism, is baptism a visible mark we see? No, it's invisible, but is it there? Does God see it? Absolutely. Now, is the mark of the beast a visible, literal mark? Maybe, but I might make the argument if we compare it to the seal of Christ, this is an invisible mark that marks people as serving who? Satan, the seal of Christ on our forehead marks as a serving who? Christ. Christ. The mark of the beast marks as a serving <laughs> Satan. Each mark gives the person who has it certain benefits and disadvantages. If you don't have the mark of the beast on your forehead, which may not be a visible mark, but a mark that you are uh, not one of Christ's, what are you allowed to do in the world? What does it say here in Revelation chapter 13? Buy or sell. Buy or sell. This may be a symbol for saying, are there advantages for people who do not want anything to do with the faith of Jesus and want to just live life to the fullest and to participate in all the corrupt practices of the world? Are there advantages to being on earth, to being one of Satan's? Yeah. This is, Satan is, is causing turmoil. He wants nothing more than Christians to be separated from God forever. So does he try to sweeten the deal? Try to make it, hey, enjoy life here. Enjoy sin. Stop it when people shame you and saying you can't do these things. Just do whatever you want to do. This is the stuff coming out of whose mouth? 
uh, Satan, the false prophet, the second beast, right? To try to make life something great when actuality, uh, if you were the mark of the beast, what happens at the end? Cast in the hell. Cast in the hell. But it goes on right now. People want more and more and more. They're not satisfied. Are people marked by the second beast right now? Yes. This is now. And that's the really key here, Rebecca, right? These, this is the same story told over and over and over in Revelation. All the way from Jesus ascending into heaven. Remember, so now we're telling the story again. He ascends into heaven. He drives out Satan. Satan goes down and tries to persecute Christians. And then chapter 14. Which I will try to read really fast. Um, oh, I, we can't go to chapter 14. I've got to talk about 666 first. Um, all right, the number of the beast, 666. What does 666 mean? Any guesses? Uh, Satan's mark. Satan's mark, sure. Why 666? Seven is the number of completion. Oh, you're going to steal my thunder, Richard. Okay, okay. So let's start here. What does it mean by that? I don't know Okay, so I'll explain. I'll explain. Let's start by saying 666. We're not referring to a total here, like 666. We're referring to maybe 6 dash 6 dash 6. The number 6 three times. Now, let's talk about that number. 7 we know as God's number. Mm -hmm. How many days did God seven take days. to create? Seven days. Seven days. So seven is complete. We see this over and over in Revelation, other places in the Gospels, or in the, in, the, in the Word of God, that seven is completeness. It's perfection. So how does six relate to seven? Short of perfection. It's short of perfection. <laughs> it's not perfect. So if we were to give, let's say, the true God a number, what would it be? Seven. Seven? Seven dash seven dash seven. Triune God, all three persons, are they all fully God, all perfect? Yes. So maybe what this number, 666, means is there's an inverse, a unholy trinity on earth. Three members of a trinity where that all fall short of God. Who are these three? We've talked about all three today, tonight. So Satan, Satan, the dragon, the first beast, and the Antichrist, the second beast. Isn't that cool? That's what the number 666 probably means. It's not a guarantee that's exactly what it means, right? But it's a mark of who Satan is, the unholy trinity that Satan tries to use to bring down God's people. Absolutely. But as Christians, as he says, let the one who has understanding calculate this number. Let the one who understands who Satan is and what he's trying to do, we know the work of Satan. We know the evil he's trying to do through the, the government and the culture constantly changing around us and getting less and less like the good old days, right? Oh, America used to be a Christian nation. Uh, not so much anymore, right? Uh, that's evidence of the first beast working now. And the second beast, the false prophet, who not only points to the first beast, but also talks about maybe other religions, anywhere, worship anything, to be spiritual with anything, just don't follow Jesus. That's the unholy trinity, and Christians see that a mile away because we know we are marked by who? By Christ and our baptism on our foreheads. We're out of time. I want to get to chapter 14, but chapter 14 is the end of the story, right? Salvation now for God's people on earth from the devil. Any final questions, Rich? Why is Satan represented as a dragon when all the other angels are just angels? Is there a reason for that, or is it because of his malintent? So when Satan is listed as a dragon, he is also talked about in that same verse as a serpent. 
So a, a serpent with wings, you could describe a dragon as, right? Uh, so a serpent who has power, uh, but not all powerful. Satan is also described as a fallen star. So remember, it's, in Revelation, stars are what? Our angels. So he is coupled with angels too. Is he maybe a more powerful angel? Uh, you could probably deduce that, right? Um, but remember, I, real quick, we just heard the story about Jesus kicking Satan out of, of heaven and going down onto earth. We already heard about this before in the second sevenfold vision when what happens to the fallen star? It goes down and it goes to the bottomless pit. Satan is bound. That's the same event we're hearing again. Kind of answered your question, kind of not, but I hope that was helpful. It's interesting, it's a very specific detail. Yes. 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 The closest thing we got to is the four living creatures with the uh, animal parts for the archangels. So maybe there is something to that, that the more powerful the angel is, the more animal uh, features it is given in this vision. But again, we're wading through tons of symbolism right now. So to make absolute statements about that, I, I'm not, I'm not going to go that far. But it might be a good thought, certainly. Well, you talked the serpent in Genesis. Absolutely, certain. Yep, yep, yep. Good. Let's pray, shall Let's pray, shall we? Dear God, Father in heaven, how humbling it is to hear about all the things happening in heaven while we're down here. But how encouraging it is to know that you are in control. That Christ has been crowned king and Satan had no power in heaven. And he has been kicked down to earth not to leave us with the wolves, but he has been bound here on earth too. So that no matter what happens in the church, he cannot defeat us. Even all his servants, all his messengers, the first and the second beast, they cannot defeat us either because Jesus' victory is absolute for us. Remind us of that in our days of trial, in our days of sadness, in our days of asking Christ, when is it all going to be over, Lord? Please let it be soon. Let's be reminded that God is in control and he loves us so much. Protect us this night. Keep us safe this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.